Yeah. <laughs> All right, I think we're uh, going to get started. Uh, welcome everyone to today's MGB Neurology Grand Rounds. Uh, my name is Dina Godfrey. I'm the current Child Neurology Chief Resident at MGH. Uh, we have people joining in person and virtually, so thank you all for being here. Uh, we'll have time at the end for questions. Um, it is my distinct honor today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Ron Fiebert, Associate Professor of Neurology and Pediatrics at MGH. He is the director of the Angel Syndrome Clinic and the 15Q Duplication Syndrome Center. He is also the co-director of the Pitt Hopkins Clinic and the Fellin McDermott Clinic as well. After graduating from the Kansas City University of Medicine and Biosciences Medical School, in 2000, Dr. Thiebert completed his pediatrics residency at Henry Ford Health System. Then in 2003, moved to Boston for his pediatric neurology residency at Tufts Floating Hospital and Boston Children's Hospital. He then continued his training with a fellowship in clinical neurophysiology and pediatric epilepsy at MGH and joined the faculty here in 2008. Dr. Thiebert is a major innovator in the world of rare diseases. He created the first Angelman syndrome clinic in the country in 2008, and then in 2010 started the first national 15Q duplication syndrome clinic. He then co-created the first Pitt Hopkins syndrome clinic and the first Fallon McDermott clinic, clinic in the country. Approximately 500 children and adults with Angelman syndrome or 15Q duplication syndrome have been seen at the clinics at Massachusetts General Hospital and the Lurie Center, which has led to publications and guidelines that have helped shape clinical care. This work has also helped to identify potential biomarkers and clinical measures to be used in gene therapy trials, which began for children with Angelman syndrome in 2020. He has been a member of the Angelman Syndrome Foundation Scientific Advisory Committee since 2009 and a member of the Duke 15 Q Alliance Professional Advisory Board since 2010. He is the recipient of several teaching awards and also received the Harry and Audrey Angelman Award for meritorious service for the Angelman Syndrome Foundation in 2017. And in 2022, he received the inaugural Fred Pitzker Award for Clinical Excellence. I've been lucky enough to work alongside Dr. Fieber on the inpatient pediatric neurology service, as well as join him in clinic, where he is surrounded by his adoring fans, his patients and their families. Thank you, Dr. Fieber, for speaking with us today. Thank, thank you so much. Um, uh, and thanks for, for having me here. It's, uh, um, it's very much an honor. Um, so today, uh, kind of as Dean was mentioning, we're going to talk about Angelman syndrome and 15 q duplication syndrome. They're uh, very, well, they're very interesting syndromes in and of themselves, but the fact that they stem from the same group of genes, um, with Asian being uh, a loss of function, the duplications being a gain of function. And so there's, uh, as we'll go through it, we'll see some uh, kind of clinical and physiological aspects that are, are uh, very much opposite, kind of based on, uh, based on the genetics. So, um, so. Oh, there we go. Um, so no disclosures in the last two years and learning objectives um, that were on the email. Um, so I figured we would start with um, the genetics of the region. Uh, it really explains a lot of the, you know, how the syndromes are different. Um, then go to the clinical manifestations of both Angelman syndrome and uh, 15Q duplication syndrome. And then I, I thought it would be interesting to talk about these two syndromes in the context of rare disease clinics. Um, with, uh, with these two clinics, we had a uh, kind of very unique situation where um, when I was finishing up fellowship, there were no clinics in, uh, in, either, um, in either area. And with Angelman specifically, uh, you know, there was already a lot of research going on on the scientific side. And the thought was that therapeutics would maybe only be 10 or 15 years away. So it was a uh, you know, syndrome with really no, no clinics, no clinical literature and therapeutics. Not, not far off. So um, it, was a, it was a really um, kind of good place to start. And I think uh, just kind of a really interesting 
kind of progression and, and just really kind of emphasizing what these kind of rare disease clinics can do as far as guiding clinical care and also, as Dina said, um, kind of establishing endpoints and, and biomarkers for, for trials. So we'll start with the genetics, which are very confusing, but this is, um, uh, so this is the critical region between breakpoints two and three. This is chromosome 15 Q, so the long arm of 15. And um, this critical region here in yellow, this is, is called the crater rolling engine uh, critical region. And um, the kind of, so this is the area that's imprinted. So uh, in outside the nervous system, uh, there is no imprinting for this region. In the nervous system, the paternal allele uh, does not make the protein, the maternal allele does. And so the maternal allele is actually methylated. And in general, when you methylate something, you kind of turn the function off. Uh, so it's a little bit counterintuitive. It's the maternal allele that's, that's methylated. But what it does is that there's this kind of um, this kind of a natural anti-sense uh, transcript that is what turns off the paternal allele. So what the methyl group is doing is turning off the mechanism that turns off the chromosome and allowing the protein to be made. So um, it's uh, so that the, the take-home is the maternal allele makes the UBE3 protein of paternal does not in the nervous system. Um, so very complicated, but uh, so this is a little girl with human syndrome. Um, it's, it's similar to Down syndrome in that the, uh, you know, the children all look very much like each other and not so much like their parents. Um, and this girl has the characteristic kind of facial features. What really stands out is the kind of platinum blonde hair, the, the, like, the, the light skin. There's a melanin gene in, in the region that's, uh, that's deleted. So kids that have deletions of chromosome 15Q uh, will also be missing that melanin gene. And, um, and that leads to the, the, the light complexion. And they're also just really cute. It's a very, very cute population. Yeah. Um, so looking at the, the specific genotypes, um, we'll go through too much detail, but the most common is deletion. So basically that, that critical region is just deleted. Um, it's a little micro deletion, the 15Q, um, kind of that, that the proximal region of it uh, is easily broken. So that's why there's so many kind of rearrangements and uh, um, syndromes that come from that neighborhood. So uh, a deletion, uh, um, so if that area is deleted, um, it's a deletion. Uh, so you're not making you know, not, not making protein at all. But oops, there's also um, I forgot to mention there's also GABA receptor genes in that area. So uh, I think a lot of the reason that the um, uh, the deletions are more uh, more severely affected is because it's not just the UBE3 gene, which is kind of the main gene in the syndrome, but also the uh, the GABA genes. And then, um, so UBE3 mutation is just kind of what it sounds like the, the gene itself where UBE3 is mutated. Um, depending where it is, it can either make, have no production or minimal production of the gene. So there's a little bit of a difference in um, phenotype just based on how much protein they're making. Uh, then imprinting center detach, which is just the, uh, you know, that, the area where the maternal chromosome is methylated. If that is not functioning properly, then it won't do what it's supposed to and block the, block the antisense. And these are, um, both the uh, most rare, but also the, the least effective. And then UPD, which is two copies of the paternal chromosomes. So they have two paternals, either one is activated. And, and, um, and well, we're not gonna be talking about Prader-Willi syndrome. Prader-Willi syndrome is pretty much the same, but for the paternal allele. Um, and a lot of people ask me why we have the next arrangement and the duplications and not Prader-Willi, but the answer is pretty easy. It's just that they don't have seizures, so they don't have much reason to see an epileptologist. And the kids with Duke 15, the features aren't quite as striking. If you see enough of them, you see the similarities between them, but they don't kind of jump out the way kids with Down or Angelman do. Um, some of the big features are this, uh, the hippocampal folds and also um, kind of the large teeth. Uh, and so for duplications, um, there's three different kinds. The most common by far is, is uh, isodicentric duplication. So it's two um, you know, normal chromosomes, maternal, paternal. But then also a uh, 47th chromosome, they used to call it a mirror chromosome 15, uh, it's not called isodicentric, but it's, it's, it's actually two extra copy places, um, 15Q and also 15Q, there's no PRM, it's just two. So these kids will have four copies, um, three maternal and, uh, and 47 chromosomes. The, for the interstitial, um, they only have the 46 chromosomes. The, uh, the, there's one extra uh, uh, 15Q uh, region kind of, Kind of within the maternal chromosome, and so they only have 46 chromosomes and three copies. And there's definitely 
kind of a dosing difference when it comes to the uh, duplications. Um, kind of the more you have, the more severe. We've seen a few kids that um, there's, not, there's really aren't that many, but that have two of these marker chromosomes, so they have six copies, and they're really severely affected, and their epilepsies are just not responsive to much of anything. Um, and then uh, this rare type, we've actually seen about eight or nine kids with these, so um, kind of seeing more and more, but it's an initial triplication. Um, so the pictures really show, but there would be three in here. So they have four copies of 15Q, much like the isolated centric kids, but 46 chromosomes, like the interstitial kids. And um, from that small sample, the, uh, the kids that we've seen seem to be kind of in the middle clinically. Um, they either kind of look more like very kind of high functioning isolated centric kids or more lower functioning interstitial. So um, that's a, it's a paper we're going to be right, but we'll hopefully get to it. Um, but uh, those are very rare. So it's, it's mostly acidic centric and then um, some of the interstitial kids as well. So those are the, um, that's been the genetics. So it's a very interesting region. Um, and, uh, uh, and just the way that, you know, depending on the parent of origin and then loss or gain of function, so you get very different syndromes. But one of the really important things looking at clinically is that um, the, uh, the um, it's only imprinted in neurons. So, in, uh, in cells outside the nervous system, the, you know, the paternal allele is, is functional and it's making the protein. But it's really just in the nervous system that if you knock out the maternal allele that you get these abnormalities. So when you think about the clinical symptoms, uh, they're pretty much um, you know, kind of brain and nervous system related, uh, neurologic, psychiatric, developmental, and then also um, other kind of systems outside the nervous system that uh, have a lot of neural input. So the GI system is the biggie with all the autonomic input to it. Um, and then orthopedic and also ophthalmologic, just uh, with, uh, with, with low tone, you can get orthopedic and uh, um, kind of eye movement problems. So, so kind of looking at the manifestations, what's really interesting is that um, reception of movement disorder and a little bit of sleep, it's the same problems, but just differently presenting. So epilepsy is very common in both. Um, Angelman syndrome has some movement disorder associated, which we don't see so much in the uh, kids with 15Q. Um, sleep disorders, we see it in both, more in Angelman and the kids with 15Q, it's more kind of standard sleep uh, problems we see in kids with autism. It's not really much above and beyond that, whereas in Angelman syndrome it is. Um, GI dysfunction is very common. Anxiety and behavior is uh, a big piece that's really been kind of um, underdiagnosed, under underappreciated um and and those uh anxiety and they can present in, in really strange ways uh you know kind of obvious anxiety behavior but also we'll see sick but um uh but that's an area where um uh you know we're just they're really starting to get looked at more chris Geary at the Lurie center um, and psychiatry in our clinic is uh is really starting to to look into that a lot more he's already put a couple of papers out and so so it's an area that really needs more attention and it's, it's starting to get it, which is great. And then, uh, like I mentioned with orthopededics and ophthalmologic, I won't go into details on those, but um, you know, with low tone, you're more likely to have orthopedic problems. And same thing in the eyes, um, you know, the kind of low tone in the eye muscles, uh, a lot of strabismus um, and uh, a lot of kids will need surgery for that. So getting, uh, getting to the, uh, the, the nitty gritty for um, procedures, uh, we'll talk about angel syndrome first and 15Q. With Angel syndrome, uh, Angelman syndrome, it's a generalized epilepsy, which is really important because medicines that are uh, meant to treat more focal and tonic-clonic seizures can actually exacerbate seizures in Angelman syndrome. So that has to be broad spectrum anti-epileptics. Even if they have focal spikes and focal seizures, it's still, it's a little bit like Lennox Gasto, it's still treated as a generalized epilepsy. And some of those medicines can really uh, uh, worsen things. And uh, I'll talk about that a little bit later. But the main seizure types are, um, atonic, myoclonic, and atypical absence, as well as tonic-clonic, and then um, some of the kids also having some focal onset seizures. They commonly begin around two and a half or three years of age, um, but can, be, uh, can occur earlier, and especially if there's fever, uh, often the first seizures in the setting of fever, um, not so much that it's a febrile seizure, but that, that's just kind of the, uh, the trigger for the, for the seizure. They're usually most difficult to control early on, and kind of embrace the years, um, uh, kind of consistent with you know, other kind of one gasto type epilepsies. Um, but they tend to get better um, uh, with age. And uh, a series that we published two years ago on adults, um, we found that a quarter of adults continued to have seizures into adulthood, but out of those quarter, uh, roughly two thirds really only had sporadic seizures monthly, yearly. Um, so it's really less than 10% that have more difficult to control seizures still into adulthood. 
Um, and then genetic subtypes, this, these might be a little bit overestimated because from the seizure survey, but with deletions, it's definitely 90% or more that have seizures. The UVD and UVE3A in the, the survey we did a while back, it was um, found that 75% of those two subgroups, it's probably more like two thirds to three quarters. Um, so definitely less than um, these are deletions, but still a, a pretty sizable amount. And then uh, because of the imprinting center defects, which are only you know, less than 5%, uh, we found that it was about 55%, but what we're seeing in clinic is probably less than 50%. They're really by far the most mildly affected. Um, and so this is uh, an example of a with non-convulsive status. Um, it's just really constant spiking. It's really uh, an absent status is what we would think of it as. And um, it's really common in Angelman syndrome. The ranges in the literature um, are from 50 to 90%. Those are mostly older studies. What we've seen in clinic, just kind of looking back through our um, because that we've seen over the years is more like 20 to 25%. And I think a big piece of that is the medicines that were being used uh, back when the other studies were done. Um, we'll, uh, as we get further and we'll look at uh, um, like what medicines had been uh, prescribed back at that time. And a lot of them were medicines that clearly exacerbate seizures. So I think a big chunk of that, uh, that big number was just kids that were on their own medicines. Um, so it most commonly occurs after an illness or sleep, uh, sleep disruption. One of the most common things is because they go on vacation, not sleep well at all, come back, and still kind of look tired, even if they're you know getting good sleep. And then the parents notice that they're not communicating as much, they're more clumsy, and then that's uh, you know that's the non-convulsive status that's kind of kicked in. So it, it can start really fast, but it can also turn off really fast. Um, the we use um, uh, benzos for that that are really um, super helpful, and and uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and what we always tell parents is that regression is not part of the syndrome. They, they don't regress, they don't go backwards unless there's a reason. So when we have someone that's uh, showing some developmental regression, we always think, is this not pulsive status? Um, and if, you know, uh, ideally you get an EEG right away, but if the clinical symptoms really fit, we often we just treat um, just, to, just to avoid kind of a loss of time. And there's a, kind of a, a newer described um, epileptic encephalopathy called my, my clinic status and non-progressive encephalopathies, which is uh, really rare, but um, as rare as it is, Asian syndrome is the most common cause of it. I think we've seen probably two or three over the years, but it's basically non-convulsive status with frequent myoclonic um, uh, jerking. And then um, epilepsy. So the, this is what we call the notch delta. So somewhere over 95% of kids in Asian will have this. Um, it's, it's basically delta activity and the notch is the sharp component within it. At times it looks kind of just like a baby, um, let's see, like this, which is great. So this is a little bit like kind of secondary, but others are just like someone took a bite out of the top. Um, so it's really delta with just some kind of uh, kind of admix sharp activity. Um, we don't think it's epileptiform. And kind of what we've seen over the years is that, um, uh, you know, the kind of the better kids are doing developmentally, um, the less of that we see, the kind of the more struggles they have, the more of it we see. And um, there's well, later on we'll talk about a good study that uh, that's really kind of quantified that and um, showed that to be the case. But that's a very common EEG signature. So uh, moving on to uh, 15Q duplications, it's it's very different epilepsy. Um, the whereas Angelman is really very generalized, and you have to you know, use the broad span, broad spectrum of epileptics. In 15Q duplications, it's more of a focal, multifocal. Um, in a lot of ways, like tuberous sclerosis, it's, you know, you don't get those big tubers, but um, for kids that have passed away, they've done uh, postmortem pathology, and the brain shows uh, lots of little areas of uh, dysplasia and heterotopia. Um, actually, I'll come back to this slide, but uh, we did a little case series of or so uh, years back, and um, what we see is that you know, the brain looks fairly normal. Um, there are some scientific ankle abnormalities. They uh, can be a little bit smaller, kind of abnormally rotated. That's really the only kind of radiographic sign that we see. Um, the, uh, rarely someone will have a clear dysplasia on MRI, but most of those uh, kind of dysplastic and heterotopic areas are um, really just microscopic and, and we don't see them on, on, radio, on the MRI, but they're there. And so kind of like any um, syndrome that has uh, dysplastic brain, um, the two seizure types that are, you know, we don't see an Asian, but we do see 15 few tonic seizures and spasms. Um, so that's one of the big differences between the two, uh, between the two uh, syndromes. In seizure prevalence, it's really interesting how um, diverse it is. Again, you know, not like tuberous sclerosis, 
about 50 to 60 percent of kids with isolated centric duplications will have seizures. And um, this really great little data on kids with interstitial duplications, we estimate about 8 to 15 percent. That kind of comes from what we've seen in clinic, um, a seizure survey that we did years back, and then um, and then a, a study that Larry Ryder sent this did. Um, but in, in each case, it was you know 10 to 15 kids, so there's really not a lot of data. But it, it seems to be in that um, pretty much in the same area as uh, kids that are kind of with high functioning autism, kind of that like you know, eight to 15 percent range. And then um, just kind of going back to the epilepsy itself, uh, is relatively common. In the study that we did, that was a kind of questionnaire study. It was 26 percent. Those are usually uh, a little bit overestimated. So the true um, Prevalence is, is probably lower, but still very noticeable. Uh, infantile spasms less than one year of age, they typically have hypsarrhythmia. Um, what's interesting, and, and it's hard to say because it was a small, uh, small there's only 19 kids, but they just find a really relative prevalence on an ACTH. Uh, uh, about 70% had a 90% improvement. Whereas if like average Shannon, it was only 29% had a greater than 90%, and then an additional 14 greater than 50. So less than half of the seven responded well to like average and that could just be small sample size, but one thing we always wonder with these two syndromes is, uh, you know, medicines that affect uh, GABA, um, you know, with you know, with the with the GABA receptor genes being uh, deleted or duplicated, we know that they all have abnormal GABA transmission. So, um, with any of the GABA drugs, when there's kind of these unusual findings, either working really well or not well, that, that question always comes up: Is this because of um, the genetics that, uh, that that we see that? But again, it's only it's only seven kids, but um, but just very interesting with the genetics of it all. Um, and then for the kids that do have seizures, it's really very uh, in a very heterogeneous. Um, roughly half will have focal seizures, and the kids with focal seizures, it's very similar to the general autistic population. Um, most common time to start is early childhood or adolescence, and um, and they respond reasonably well to medicine. Kind of you know forty ish percent the first medicine. Um, uh, and uh, you know more than that will generally be well controlled. The ones that um, have spasms, but then also one of the, some of the ones that don't have spasms, they will go on to a uh, lennox gasto type syndrome with you know, the tonic seizures, the atonic seizures, and often epileptic spasms that come back later in life. And these kids are by far the, the one of the most refractory kind of uh, epilepsies that we see. Um, they, what's really interesting about the Lennox Castro pattern is that typically um, following infantile spasms or even not following it, Lennox Castro will often start, you know, two, three, four, kind of in that early childhood era. Um, but because with, uh, with 15 key duplications, we see it start more at seven, eight, nine, sometimes 10. So, you know, you kind of think they're kind of out of that danger area when they get to be six or seven, but they, they start later. Um, it's not clear why, but it's definitely a pattern that we've seen. Um, and I always, you know, when kind of comparing the two epilepsies, uh, I would say if we, if we kind of lined them all up from kind of easiest to hardest to control with both syndromes, the you know, 10, 20 kind of easiest to control would all be kids with Duke 15, and the 10, 20, 30 most difficult to control would all be Duke 15. It's really quite the spectrum. Um, some are very easy, some are nearly impossible. And the other big difference is that uh, Duke 15 has a relatively high rate of SUDEP. Um, it's kind of estimated to be somewhere in the neighborhood of Dravet, about one in 150 per year, whereas with Angelman syndrome, um, We've never had one, luckily. Um, the foundation doesn't know of any. Um, it's probably not zero, but it's, it's really, really rare. So it's another big difference between the, um, the two. And that's, and that's why we have pathology to look at, because of all the student cases that have been going on. Um, and then we don't see really so much on the status with kids with Duke 15, but we see electrical status that would have uh, kids of sleep. Uh, kids go to sleep when they have this very kind of classic ESES type pattern. What's interesting is, um, again, kind of going back with the, uh, the whole GABA thing, benzos tend to not work so well. They, they respond much better to prednisone, much like the spasms. So again, is, you know, with the GABA not helping as much, with the benzos not really being super helpful for this, is, you know, is it the GABA receptor duplications that, uh, that are kind of driving that? Um, but it's, you know, it, the, the typical balance of what it calls to be, don't work for these kids. And then this was just kind of really interesting finding that we, um, that we see in, in sleep and kids with duplication that have the Lennox gasto type epilepsies. Um, this is very high voltage, very fast, almost 15 to 20 hertz spikes. Um, they just kind of come go throughout the night. They're often, uh, you know, appear interrectal, but every now and then we'll see kids that kind of stiffen up a little bit. 
So they're, we think they're more kind of in the interictal spectrum, um, but they can be very frequent at night. And, uh, and the EEG isn't that flat, it's kind of turning the game down to, to you know, so, so you can actually see the spikes. They're very high voltage in addition to being very fast. Um, and then uh, another really interesting thing, so this, you know, first week as we started seeing, if you just look at this EEG, it seems like it's pretty easy to interpret. It's a kid on benzos. So it's, you know, just all this played activity everywhere. But this child was not on benzos. And um, so what we really see is that pretty much every kid with using duplication has all this beta activity um, just at baseline, which, um, you know, as we'll talk about later, uh, you know, is a really good biomarker, much like the Nox Delta enangement. Um, but again, we think it's the, the GABA receptors that are doing that. So um, everything really kind of points towards like GABA dysfunction. The gene rise angelman is really, um, you know, mainly a one, a single gene disease with UBE3A. Uh, Duplication is really kind of a multi gene. And the GABA, what we think, probably plays even a bigger role in the UBE3A in the, uh, um, in the etiology of it. So, movement disorders, um, the, uh, um, we put in too much detail, but tremor and ataxia are very super common in angelman syndrome, pretty much universal. And um, uh, tremors, uh, an attention tremor that's kind of there from very early on. Um, it'll get worse when kids are sick or overtired. Uh, the ataxia also is, is always there. And when children begin walking, they have this very wide base gait and they hold their arms up like this to, to balance themselves. And so when Angelman syndrome was first described in the 60s by Dr. Angelman, um, we called it the happy puppet syndrome because they have very happy disposition. Uh, some, some years later, it was kind of wisely decided that wasn't a great name for a syndrome. So they renamed it uh, after him and called it Angelman syndrome. And then um, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but that's been a really interesting finding that we've been seeing. Um, and looking at just kind of the overall developmental delay of this disease, um, it's, it's really interesting. Uh, one of the kind of opposite things that we see with these two disorders is social interactions. Kids with Duke 15 are almost universally, uh, they almost they meet criteria for autism spectrum. Um, uh, a recent study that uh, Shafali Jesse and uh, her group did um, in UCLA, uh, pretty much everyone they tested, everyone, everyone uh, qualified for ASD. So it's almost universal. For Angelman, very few actually meet criteria for that. And um, as opposed to kids with 15Q that have more of the typical kind of withdrawn uh, lack of eye contact autism, with Angelman, they're very hyper social. They have boundaries. Um, well, often they're aggressively social or sometimes painfully social, but just very happy, very excited to see people, and um, uh, so very much the other end of the spectrum. Um, they uh, a really interesting finding about Angelman syndrome is that their receptive speech is much better than their extra, uh, recept um, expressive speech. The um, kids with deletions are essentially nonverbal, all of them, but they understand almost everything that's going on. Um, kids that have uh, not relation, so especially the ones with the, with the gene mutations, um, they can have dozens of words. And we actually have a pair of siblings that talk in sentences. It's, it's really just them that do that. But, um, but uh, uh, you know, with, with the, with the uh, gene mutation, it's really variable depending where it is. But in general, they're, they're nonverbal, but with excellent receptive speech. So when they're young, that leads to a lot of frustration um, and behavioral outbursts because they don't think they're being understood. Um, either they aren't being understood or they think they're not being understood. And um, and just another kind of um, uh, just kind of difference between deletion and non deletion. Uh, just the, you know, the, the kids um, that uh, have deletions, they typically walk three and a half, four, sometimes earlier, sometimes a little bit later. And with, uh, with the non deletion subtypes, they're typically walking by two. So um, you know, they tend to do everything a little bit faster, but that's just, uh, I think, one of the ones that kind of stands out. And then with, um, with the kids that do 15, uh, in addition to the autism, um, they have very low tone, um, almost in that kind of down syndrome, right, a really kind of uh, low tone neighborhood. And, um, you know, uh, axial and appendicular, especially distally, they have very low tone distally, and that really interferes with fine motor skills. And the ones who are um, more nonverbal for using uh, AEC devices with the, with the low tone, it's really hard for them. Even if they kind of know what they want to say, the motor, the motor piece of it's hard. So um, that almost as much as, as uh, the cognition really gets back to communication when they're young. Um, and with, um, you know, for the kids with interstitial, nearly all of them are verbal. The only one that's not that we that we have seen is um, uh, he actually has twin sisters who also have the duplication. They all inherited it from their mom, and um, uh, they are verbal. So it, it makes us wonder if he has a second uh, hit somewhere. Um, and uh, kind of on that same point, the um, uh, 
So gene mutations, um, and, and for the, in, in the case of the initial duplications, that those can be inherited because with the imprinting, if they're on a woman's paternal chromosome and they pass it on to their kids, now it becomes the maternal chromosome and then it becomes symptomatic. So, um, you know, deletions, uh, you, you know, UPD, those things aren't inherited, but the gene mutations can be, and, um, and these interstitial duplications can be, the, um, the thing that I said, essentially, you can't, you can't pass that on. But, um, but so there's a uh, couple, you know, a small percentage of these could be inherited. Um, and then um, looking at sleep, um, with kids with dupe 15, it's, the sleep is pretty consistent, but just autism in general, maybe the 30 kids have some trouble either falling asleep or staying asleep. It's much more um, pronounced in Angelman syndrome. It's really a much bigger part of the syndrome. So uh, initially when they did the uh, diagnostic criteria back in um, 95 and 05, they called it an abnormal sleep-wake cycle and diminished need for sleep. Um, of course, no, nobody has a diminished need for sleep. They all need to sleep, but they are just awake and happy. So they look like they don't need to sleep. Um, but clearly if they stay sleep deprived, you know, they, they struggle. But, um, but, but that's really the common thing is either staying up super late or just waking up in the middle of the night, staying up and looking happy while they do it um, is, uh, is a big, uh, big issue in Angelman syndrome. Um, caregiver reports in various um, uh, studies that are out there are ranged from 40 to 80%. Um, again, uh, the GABA receptor genes we think probably have a role, but UB3A itself has been shown to um, directly affect the circadian rhythm. So just having, um, uh, you know, uh, a lack of UB3A is, is probably a big part of the sleep issue. And then on top of just the genetic reasons to not sleep well, kids that have epilepsy are on various epilepsy medications, GI dysfunction, anxiety, those will also affect sleep even beyond the, um, the genetic uh, aspect of it. Um, a survey that we did back in 2009, um, uh, numbers were pretty consistent, about 58% of parents reported sleep difficulties, um, mainly difficulty falling asleep, but also uh, waking. And then we did it at the same time as a seizure survey, so we saw also a significant correlation between sleep and epilepsy, which was not surprising. And then um, the initial kind of Angelman um, uh, survey that we did in adulthood, um, that, uh, that actually analyzed and just with, uh, what we saw was what parents had reported was compared from adulthood compared to infancy and to childhood, 77% um, compared to infancy, 68% compared to childhood, felt that sleep was better in adulthood. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, close to a quarter were unchanged, but only six or 7% were, were worse. So, so sleep tends to get a little bit better, epilepsy tends to get a little bit better, um, uh, behavior tends to get worse. Um, and then also, um, <laughs> which we'll talk about towards the end. Um, and then um, I was really kind of focusing on the Eastern neurological symptoms, but also to kind of throw in GI because it's so uh, prevalent and really can affect so many things. Um, you know, what we, what we typically see is uh, that, and um, kind of not surprising kids with neurogenic syndromes in general, um, typically have decreased gut motility, low tone in the, in the GI tract. And so, uh, you, know, you know, theoretically to abnormal autonomic input. And, um, so just at baseline, they're starting off with this uh, kind of uh, uh, kind of tending to uh, have GI dysfunction, but then most of them are picky eaters. They don't like to drink fluids. Um, a lot of it's a sensory kind of thing, so that just makes things worse. And then um, and then we make things worse by putting them on certain medications like clobazam or um, or uh, other kinds of diazepines. Um, and then just kind of thinking about like what you know, other than just having the GI dysfunction, what it can do. Um, you know, we see the kids with GI pain, they're especially reflux, and they weigh down at night and they're flat. <laughs> they see reflux wake kids up at night. Um, definitely GI pain will exacerbate uh, negative behaviors, anxiety. Um, and we even see it uh, correlate with increased seizures, um, uh, possibly directly, but, but um, probably more indirectly through worsening sleep, worsening anxiety. Um, there's also risk for medical complications like aspiration pneumonia if they're reflexing. You know? um, so uh, we did uh, like a small case series on, um, on both syndromes uh, uh, at various points in the past. And um, what we found is kind of what we expected, but there's nothing in the literature. So we thought it would be good to kind of look through and just kind of get it out there. Um, overall, about 86% of the human syndromes, 79% for um, Duke 15. Uh, constipation, uh, by far the most common reflux, not far behind. Um, what we saw interestingly in Duke 15 whether they had isodecentric or interstitial um, 
the GI symptoms were pretty much the same. Um, in Angelman syndrome, the constipation reflux really didn't change much by subtype. But what we did see was um, in kids with deletions, um, the, the few kids that had G-tubes all had deletions, the few that had eosinophilic esophagitis had deletions. So the, the more kind of severe upper GI type symptoms were really just kids with deletions, but the constipation and uh, reflux were more universal. Um, okay, so, uh, so that's kind of the basic um, you know, uh, clinical symptoms. Uh, but so to kind of talking a little about the clinics and then trying to kind of tie this into uh, Kind of what we've learned and and uh, uh, and what kind of uses we've had. Um, our so the, the Angelman, as, as Dana mentioned, we started the Angelman Clinic in two thousand eight, and at the time there there were no Angelman clinics um, in the U.S. I think actually even in the world. But um, it was it was a really interesting kind of situation where there were um, you know it had been described for a while. There were a lot of researchers uh, working on it and really going through the basic science and. Um, We'll, we'll see why a little bit later, but uh, and there's a well-established foundation, but no clinics and really very little in the clinical literature. So we um, we started seeing uh, kids in 08, and I, I kind of thought maybe we would see like 20, 50, um, but we've actually gotten all the way up to 350 over the years, um, anywhere from infants to adults, 50. Um, we've seen families from 38 states, seven countries, and in the clinic, the specialties really match the clinical symptoms. So. Um, I see everybody uh, from neurology epilepsy standpoint, and then um, that the two most common, uh, two next most common uh, specialties are psychiatry and GI. Um, teens and adults much more commonly need psychiatry. Younger kids much more commonly need GI, um, but also uh, neuropsychology, sleep medicine, and then kind of as needed uh, orthopedics or ophthalmology. Those and then also the uh, the various um, services, but, but those are usually best just to have done locally. And then, um, because the uh, the genes are the same for for both syndromes, it's a lot of the same science folks that go to the same conferences. So it's a lot of overlap between the two. After we started the Angelman syndrome, the 15Q folks said, "Let me start a 15Q clinic." And so um, we did. Not really thinking that it was going to get that big, um, but we've seen now about 150, so about 500 total, um, anywhere from less than a month to 35 years. Um, not quite as many states, but still all over the country and from some other countries. And um, the specialties um, pretty much the same. Like I said, it's the same, the same uh, uh, like categories of clinical manifestations, but just different. Whether it's a gain of function, loss of function, and um, what's really been nice. So uh, you know, after so we started the clinic in two thousand eight, and then a couple of years later, the um, the foundation was able to get funding from a third party. We're not third party, but it was with the stipulation that it was just for clinical care. So they decided to give us a little bit of funding and uh, a, a clinic in North Carolina. So then there were two clinics and um, that, that, book, that seemed to go well. So those clinics kind of kept growing and growing. And then the Duke 15 clinic, we present our findings two years later, um, actually at a meeting here in Boston uh, um, and uh, people kind of, kind of like the data. So, um, so people in Duke 15 started to, to set up clinics. But what was interesting was that we were the only one that was still both clinics, but it was a group of Asian clinics popping up, do 15 clinics popping up. And what's been really cool the last few years is that, um, you know, that as, as time's gone on, the two uh, foundations have kind of gotten more and more intertwined, you know, with the, the science being very similar. So um, now that there's now that there's a whole uh, kind of network set up, and there's 20 clinics in the US now that see both Asian and 15Q, and um, uh, as well as I think four other countries. So, um, so now there's, you know, with all these clinics, there's more data to be gained. They're starting a, a database to um, kind of put what we're seeing kind of into databases that make it a little bit more, um, uh, a little more standardized. And also they, they become sites for clinical trials when the time comes. So that's been a very exciting uh, kind of aspect. So just kind of looking at some of the um, kind of the novel findings that we've seen in the clinic, um, I thought it'd be kind of interesting to go over some of the stuff that we, didn't know before we started seeing patients and then that kind of popped up. Um, uh, so these are the, the things we'll be taking a look at, but um, this one is very interesting. So this was a study that we did um, uh, back in, in published it back in 2015. Um, and uh, so looking at the, the medicines that I described, what I kind of I was talking about before with muscle uh, status, um, develop of gas, and not as a handle, but drug use, how we described, but then feed barbitol, couple down, don't have to be, couple down, 
kind of telling himself, you know, kids on those medicines were probably worse off for being on them. And I'm guessing that was part of the reason why we're seeing a lot more um, non shadows. But what really kind of stood, stood out on this um, result of um, you know, it was the first real kind of broad spectrum estimate, you know, so it made sense that all these kids were on it. And back in the 80s and 90s, it was the best option. But what we started seeing in, um, in our survey and also in clinic, uh, with the survey results, and I think we had about 500, um, uh, 500 um, surveys returned. There was, uh, you know, we saw one, uh, one parent that reported, you know, that uh, I, one of the kids actually stopped walking when I started Depakote. Maybe that was probably just coincidence. They were not compulsive. Then there was another one and another one. And, and really just kind of way more than I would have expected. Um, and then we started seeing the same thing in clinic. Kids that were um, really just not progressing the way we thought they would. They were on Depakote, started taking kids off Depakote or Valproic acid. And then um, we eventually kind of went back um, several years later and just kind of looked at the uh, the medicines they were prescribing and the kids on. And I think these three kids are the three most common that were there, but the side effects are much higher in Valproic acid. And even though the you know the sixty six percent is impressive, it was the severity of some of them. We the, the most impressive um, uh, case I saw that was a fourteen year old. Um, you know, we, we can see this. We kind of consulted here and there and see this level, but he was put on uh, Valproic acid when he was two, and he was just on it for his whole life because it did help with the seizures. Um, but he never walked, and then they thought it was due to um, scoliosis. He got that repaired. He still wasn't walking, and. Um, Finally, he was able to talk to parents into coming off because he'd been on it forever. So they were scared to come off it. But finally, um, got uh, got talked to him into uh, getting him off. And then a couple months later, he sent us a video of him like walking up the stairs at the football stadium at the school. So it, it's it can be really impressive. And um, you don't know, but my my theory is that um, uh, you talk to the researchers. That there's a lot of UV in the mitochondria. So I think this is probably a very mild version of what we see with. Kids with mitochondrial disorders to get take all acid. It's not nearly as severe, or scary, but it's kind of a mild version of that. Um, and again, it's not everybody. Some don't have any side effects. Some have mild side effects, but some really have pretty severe um, uh, motor regression. And then um, another big thing that, um, that that we saw was um, so we did a um, uh, prospective trial for the LJ2, which is actually the first trial for that um, diet. Uh, and um, only six subjects, but uh, we had good results. Four out of six were 90% seizure free uh, at month four, one out of six, 50 to 90%, and then the other one, not quite. So, um, so pretty good results in a, in, a, in, a, in a like true prospective trial, even though it's a small amount. And one thing that I really think is fun is that five out of those six kids, uh, we still see them for 12 to 14 years later, they're all still on diet um, and they're all doing really well at this point. So, we look back. After that was done, we just started putting a lot of kids on the, the low glycemic and um, uh, without going into all the details, um, outside of uh, illness and uh, non convulsive status, um, it was very effective for um, kids with Angelman. And not just, uh, you know, just that it was effective, but also as over time we learned that uh, instead of the typical 40 to 60 grams of carbs per day, um, they could go up size 80 or 100, still have pretty good seizure control. So um, you know, part of it could be that it's a very motivated population and the parents are really, um, uh, really kind of changes, but it, it does seem like there's, that they respond better to that diet than um, the general population. It's hard to know why. Um, so we actually got IV approval to, um, uh, to do a, a, like a prospective study to see if we could prevent or delay the onset of seizures, but we ended up kind of canceling it because everyone we saw came to us already on it. Um, with the, you know, with the, uh, you know, the child was very fast aging well. And so, you know, we'd see parents and they say, oh, we kind of started already, you know, uh, so, so we couldn't really put kids on it because they were all just putting them on it themselves. But, um, so that's been really helpful, um, especially the, the younger kids, you get them on it early, they don't, they don't know what cupcakes taste like, it these taste like, so it's a lot easier to continue the diets when they don't know what they're missing. Um, uh, and, and what we also saw that, um, you know, the, the, Typical neuropsych measures weren't really sensitive enough to show was that um, uh, that uh, you know that they tended to have a better development uh, kind of developmental track. A lot of it was focused. I think it was much more focused when they're not kind of having those sugar eyes and crashes. Um, but um, but just kind of anecdotally, we've noticed that. Um, 
we missed one to study that we did with uh, actually Lila Warden helped us with this a few years ago. Um, uh, and the, the concept of, uh, of a benzodiazepine making seizures better is not groundbreaking at all. But what, um, what, what was interesting was that um, just kind of doing a typical oral diazepam tapers um, is really effective for getting things in. And just the fact that they can have, um, uh, you know, non compulsive data like that EPG that we saw just constant, constant uh, epileptic discharges. Uh, and that we could treat them at home within a week, 10 days, uh, just using oral diazepam was, um, was really, uh, really good to know. And it, we really don't have that kind of luck outside of Angelman syndrome sometimes, but often we have to bring kids in and do more um, kind of hardcore uh, IV type medicines. But, and it's, for some reason, it's, it's diazepam. It's not lorazepam, it's not clazepam. I, I can't explain that why it just works really well for kids with Angelman. Um, and, uh, uh, but, um, but so, so that was really, that's been really helpful. And just knowing that it works so well, we've been able to kind of keep kids out of the hospital um, by treating early and then um, and using, uh, kind of using the right medicine. Um, I, back when we did the study, we had 25 separate episodes in 13 kids. And 20, 20 out of 25, we were able to um, uh, kind of break them of the, of the non-pulsive status just with oral diazepam at home. Um, the ones that didn't, um, you know, two to five, with oral prednisone at home. And then the other three had to be admitted one for oral steroids and um, two had to go to the picky for uh, the asthma. But one of those two, and some people I'm sure remember, um, was a little girl from Turkey that came to Boston and had been uh, in my chronic status for 10 months. Um, so there wasn't much we were able to do there. Um, uh, and she's doing great now. Um, but uh, overall, very well tolerated. Um, a couple of kids had fatigue, but um, you know, when, when kids eat a benzodiazepine, they typically don't have the, you know, a lot of side effects from it. And we were able to find a, a, an underlying cause in uh, more than half, whether it was poor sleep infection. Um, so if there's something there that can be treated, that's also helpful. Um, and then, um, so kind of getting back to the non-epileptic myoclonus, um, uh, when we did that big phone interview, back in, I think, the in 2010, we published it later, um, it was, uh, we started getting all these parents saying that, and, and about a third of them, that they were having these prolonged convulsive seizures, they were not chronic seizures, maybe not a chronic, but they were lasting sometimes hours, and it just didn't really match up because they were doing well developmentally and they weren't progressing, they weren't, um, you know, uh, they were still thriving. Um, and then we started seeing that in clinic as well, um, just, uh, you know, during this time with these prolonged seizures, which didn't really sound like it. and um, Start seeing the clinic and realize that they were awake, basically awake and alert during the events. There was really no post period. So we, we started to get um, patient EEGs on a couple, and then we've had, and then some of, uh, we also had some adults come to us with, uh, with discs that already had the, uh, the, 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 the EEGs. Um, so five inpatient video EEGs, seven ambulatory EEGs, and all 12 showed no um, EEG correlate. In fact, most of them were, had no blood form discharges in erectile lesion. Um, and probably the most impressive one was that uh, this one young woman in her 20s actually had an absence seizure during the, the shaking episode. So um, just more quickly, you can't seize during the seizure so much. So, um, so it really became clear this was non-epileptic. And, um, uh, and so just kind of, this is a, a paper that we put out. Um, uh, just to, again, really just to kind of get it out there. Um, didn't know what's going on. It, the kids we've seen with myoclonic seizures, we went back to our, our clinic and um, uh, you know, larger myoclonic seizures present about 15 to 40%. Uh, in our clinic, it was somewhere uh, like in that 15 to 20% neighborhood. Um, for all the kids that we had seen, the onset was before eight years of age um, and 80% before five years of age. Their brief in duration, the ones that had, had video EEG, there's a clear burst of spiking wave when they have myoclonic seizure. Um, and uh, very common uh, control when they to discharges as well. Because um, kids who are having myoclonic uh, seizure are probably also having atonic or absence in their energy to do the active. Um, for the non-epileptic myoclonus, there's a few that were, were starting as early as eight or nine, but most started in adolescence or the early 20s. The events could last seconds to minutes, but some hours, some 24 hours. Um, consciousness is preserved, they can um, communicate, they can. Um, uh, you know, they, they make good eye contact. Um, they even can try to eat and drink, and it's not too bad. Um, 
but and there's really no post -sexual period there. They're often tired, I mean, it's because it's you know my opponents are tiring. Um, but uh, and like I said, the, the you know, ones we see on YouTube are no correlates. Um, also, no no regression of, of loss of skills. So someone who's in non compulsive status are really teasing frequently. We often see a decline in their in their skills. But with with these adults that were having an active plan bonus, they were they had baseline in between. And what we saw was um, wasn't that a huge, a huge group, but um, the, you know, the, just looking back at our kind of um, folks, uh, it tended to be more prevalent the older you got. And um, like, you know, there was there were a few kids that had early onset that a little bit later, um, but most of the in the teen years of puberty pretty much brings that on. So kind of in general, Benjamin syndrome uh, after puberty, um, seizures tend to get better, sleep tends to get better. This pops up, which is um, sometimes even hard to deal with the seizures, and then also anxiety. Unfortunately, the trade off is as, uh, as they get older. Um, and then um, I think, yeah, last thing uh, to kind of talk about. Um, so, you know, those studies you know, were all kind of um, uh, you know, done to really just kind of put things out in the literature and then uh, and just really kind of, uh, you know, try to like change the clinical care system. Um, but they're also with, um, you know, kind of gene therapies in the pipeline. Um, even back as, as, as early as, uh, you know, 08, 2010. Um, it was also, you know, that information being used to help guide um, clinical trials. And so looking at the, the two syndromes, I uh, just put a slide back up just to kind of illustrate the, um, for 15 key duplications, you know, it's a multi-gene disorder, all these genes are duplicated. Um, gene therapy is a little bit tricky. Uh, there's, there's stuff being worked on, but it's not a straightforward solution. Whereas in Benjamin, um, you know, you have internal uh, copy that is often missing 15, the 15 gene region, or it's just, it's uh, it is augmentation or it's just in a functioning brain center. Um, but you have a perfectly healthy chromosome 15, it's almost like having a spare just sitting next to it. So, um, so I think that's the reason why there was so much scientific uh, kind of uh, scientific research being done before the clinical because it, it was just such a perfect setup for gene therapy with you know, this health, healthy, happy chromosome just sitting there waiting to be recreated, but, uh, but not. So um, uh, so right now there's, um, I'll just switch from clinical trials back up. There's um, there's three companies that have started trials and uh, they're all anti-sense oligonucleotides. So the, um, uh, the theory is that the, um, the ASL will bind to the Anti-sense transcript and um, and therefore not uh, not silence the paternal allele and then the paternal allele can start making the protein. So um, uh, so the first one was uh, genetics. They had been closed for a time due to some side effects. They had been off in the loach and I am this most recently. But um, but uh, you know prior to having trials, you have to have some endpoints. So. Um, uh, I think a lot of what we were able to publish um, was able to be used for, um, uh, uh, you know, we did like a, a review paper for um, for one of the uh, Canadian journals. There's a very paper out there. There's an AAP guideline being worked on. But just actually kind of getting a better understanding of the clinical picture is really helpful to make a lot of endpoints. And then um, uh, also biomarkers. So um, both, both syndromes have a very uh kind of signature that, that can be uh, that can be used. So um, kind of getting back to the notch delta. Um, again, this is this kind of this uh, I am the two so two to three hertz activity with this kind of notch. You know? And again, we uh, you just kind of anecdotally over the years uh, there's there's less delta when kids are doing better. And just in general, unless you're sleeping, the less delta the better. So you know, and, but um, uh, but it was it was not something that we were able to quantify. We did a diet study; we saw a clear decrease in the delta activity, but it was hard to quantify. But now with uh, with technology, um, it's able to be quantified. So this was a really nice study done by um, Dr. Chu and um, uh, from Anne's uh, clinical organization. And um, what what she really found was that. Um, the delta power really very nicely predicted um, cognitive scores on the, on the Bailey assessment scale. Um, so the kind of the more delta you had in your EG, the, the lower the, the scores. 
So it turned out to be a real good um, predictor of, uh, of transmission. Um, and uh, when we did, we did talk to age and gene type, and there were differences between sleeping weight and differences between type or reference. And then um, this is actually followed up by a good uh, paper on uh, the animal models uh, that had received uh, with ASO, and, um, and they were able to actually see differences in the EEG and the, in the delta. Um, the delta bands with uh, um, with treatment, so um, so that's that's a really nice biomarker for, for these trials, and then for um, two fifteen uh, again the, the whole kind of gene therapy thing is, is much further behind, but um, but but in the pipeline, and the big finding is this, uh, all this beta activity is everywhere, it's diffuse, um, consistent, and um, uh, so this study that was um, done by Shafal Jesse in uh, Los Angeles. And then we were able to it's nice to uh, talk about this a little bit. Um, but uh, what they did was they um, they looked at uh, in beta one, beta two, so 12 to 20 hertz fast activity, 20 to 30 hertz fast activity. It was significantly higher in um kids with interstitial and mesothelial patients as compared to the green which is kids with autism but not the GP, and then the typical developing controls. Um, and interestingly, the delta activity was significantly lower. And do 15 as compared to uh, as compared to the controls, and and again um, looking at delta activity, very elevated age and very decreased in do 15. So again, I think kind of illustrating the difference between um, you know, loss of function, gain of function, especially with the the GABA receptors. And I think that's it. So um, just uh, again from from the clinic. Um, uh, I'm sure this here area of research, um, really, it's probably seen as good intervention for psychiatry and intervention. Um, and I think we generally are our effective circuitry and styles of things and the diet of and large social work are showing you, um, what are the things that we can assess our, we all know, we sleep. And then just a uh, thank you to first all our families, the, all the, the you know, all the way to, to Boston to uh, become CS, um, both the foundation and the, the 215 Alliance, the Pritzker family who was always very um, helpful in supporting us. And then um, both uh, Dr. Chu, Dr. Teal have been collaborators in research and then uh, Dr. Justine, Los Angeles. And then, that's it, and there's still a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. okay. First of all, Thank you for that. It's so amazing what you've created. Uh, it's really set the stage for therapies right now. So just congratulations. Oh, thanks. Yeah, that's really exciting. And two questions related to the trials. You mentioned this database now. Yeah. Is that kind of value used in these trials? To it's it's not yet. It's 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 being um it's kind of being built for future trials. Um, but that's that's kind of the hope is that instead of you know. And like the uh, the case series, I think we're a good start, but the hope is that they can have a kind of more standardized, um, uh, you know, collected data that can really um, be used. But but um, with these, so it's, it's a little too early to get into these first trials. But the hope is that as trials continue, they'll be able to have like more kind of standardized type data for that. But the the biomarkers that are doing really helpful. Like CAT study is really very impressive. Yeah. Well, how does how does the trial work in terms of your clinic? Uh, Participation people know where the trials are. The family saying that this file this ASL is whatever. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, there's uh, with just you know kind of the way the phase one world has been. Um, families are really just kind of desperate to get into any trial, and there's way more interested families than uh, so they'll, they'll kind of go wherever their spots. Um, ideally, they you know if their clinic has a spot, they could go there, but. If not, then they would go to other places. Um, we will hopefully be open soon for one of the trials. So, but um, we had some kids weren't going to go to other places just because you know we haven't been yet. Um, and we have such a national group, like a family in Chicago, going to Chicago clinic and not having to fly to Boston every two weeks. Okay. So I'm really curious about all the children who come to localized clinic diet. Is that the same thing that you see in human syndrome, and I wonder, do you see different developmental or micro trajectories or epilepsy in the kids who are starting to do? Yeah, yeah, um, we've seen um, definitely epilepsy wise, it, it's been super effective. So, um, 
diet. And, and often it's hard to do just alone because when they get sick, they have an oncological status. So I'll trigger, but a lot of me, the several kids with on diet plus one anti epileptic medication that have been really well controlled. And um, definitely part of it is the seizure control. When you better control seizures, you're going to have better development. But, um, but I think it's a little bit more than that. And I think a big part of it is the focus, these, especially the kids with angina, are very um, impulsive, hyperactive, they don't focus well. Um, and when they're not getting these sugar spikes and crashes, they tend to be able to focus. I think that really helps as well. So, um, uh, it's too much about the body. So they're not Does it change with age given the Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. So um it uh it changes with age sometimes you see a little bit more interior as kids get older. Um but it it we see less of it when there's um fewer seizures, we see less of it when uh because they're just doing better developmentally. Um but, uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll often see a decrease in the next delta when seizures get better. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Thanks, yeah. that was great. Sure. Uh, I learned a lot. Um, this is a really basic question. Maybe I should know the answer to that. Why do you think steroids, prednisone, or Why do you think it can fix these seizures? Yeah, um, no, it's, it, it, it is a question that we all should know, but I, I, I don't know. Um, I think, you know, uh, anytime I see something about steroids, um, I wish I'd read it thinking that it's going to give the answer, but it, it never does. But um, I you know, think there's, it's the, what I've kind of read the most is that it's, it's you know, kind of anti-inflammatory effects. Um, it's kind of local anti-inflammatory type effects from the steroids. But, um, but I, 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 don't, I don't understand it. Sort of what I was getting at. Is there an inflammatory component? Yeah, there probably is. Um, and I know, and uh, Chris do at the Lurie Center also, uh, and, and others believe there's a big inflammatory component to autism. So um, uh, just that whole kind of neural inflammation topic is really kind of not super well understood yet, but it's, it's, there's, there's definitely something there to kind of figure out what it is. But, um, but yeah. But in credits on work forms, anything in the nervous system is less Yeah. I think um, I think Dr. Rosenberger oh. just wanted you to comment on the personality of angel and children. Oh, angel and whether child. or not they're um, that's a very happy yeah. personality. Yeah, yeah. So um I, I didn't really uh, get into that too uh, um uh, too much detail, but yes, very still they're overall they're just very happy. And um, in the past, it's been described as pathologically happy, but it's it's not. They're just really they're just happy kids, um, and uh, they're happy. And they're super social. Like I said, sometimes they get a little too social. They have to be dialed back. But but yeah, that uh, you know that happiness that goes from that happy, initial initial happy puppet name of the syndrome uh, is still there. They're all super happy. So and that's one of the things we always I always wonder about. Like, parents are so excited for therapies, but like I'm just afraid that you know, therapies might. And cure the happiness, which you know, we don't want to see, but um, you know, we'll we'll see. Is uh, no 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 uh, data has been released from any of the trials yet, so you know how they're going. But um, I'm really curious to see the first ones. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.